You guys, it's been so long. I'm a new pastor here on staff. I just want to tell you. And, and it, this is, it's just a blessing to be with you. I've been out. I've got to tell you something, just sort of um, how things kind of unfold for a pastor. I, I've been at this church a long time, and I have, we've had a lot of great staff people here. I just got to tell you, we've got a fantastic staff team. John would be a perfect example of that. Greg Davis, some of the other people um, on staff. And when you have a great staff team, it's easy to leave town. And so I, I've left town occasionally. So I'm just glad to be back with you. Um, and and um, uh, I'm just glad to be back with you. So we're going to look at Numbers 20 today. Let me tell you what we're going to do. So we're going to look at Numbers 20 today. This is where Moses and Aaron have an encounter with God. And um, it's really awesome. And, and, but it's very stressful. Something happens. But God really does ultimately provide water for the journey. So we'll look at Moses, uh, Numbers 20. Next week, we're going to look at Deuteronomy 34. And that's where there's a transition of actually a transition has already occurred uh, for Moses transitioning uh, leadership to Joshua. And Moses goes up on Mount Nebo to be with the Lord. And we're going to talk about that next week, so I'm really excited about that. Then John will preach a one-off on Labor Day. Then we will be starting a series in Daniel. And let me tell you why we're going to go to Daniel. Daniel is a great book to help Christians know how to live in a very secular world. And John and I will be sharing a lot of that. And the reason I want to do that is I want you to hear an older voice and I want you to hear a younger voice. We'll both come at it from the Word of God with different perspectives, which I think is going to help. I know hearing you is going to help me grow. And so I can only imagine what it will do for all of us. So we'll go to Daniel. Then we'll move to Nehemiah with that same focus of what it looks like for a Christian to live in a secular world. So, let's jump in. Let me just say that one of the things I want to talk about this morning in Numbers 20 is the fear of moving forward. The fear of moving forward. Now, I don't know if you're in a place in your life, or you have been, and I can guarantee you, you will be, you'll be in a place at some point that it, it's fearful to move forward. You know, it might be a difficult decision you need to make for any number of reasons. It might be a move. It might be a new job. It might be some sort of relational issue or any number of personal issues that you might fear moving forward. In fact, it may feel like um, jumping off a cliff. About four years ago, you guys, I was in Hawaii, and we were on vacation, and we went uh, we went to the beach there in Kauai, and it was absolutely gorgeous. So we're on the beach there, and we look over to the right, and there's a cliff probably 300 yards away. And so it was, you know, it looked, it looked like a really high cliff. It looked beautiful. We kept swimming. And then all of a sudden, you could hear the cliff call to you. <laughs> and it called, and it said, jump off me. Well, my son and I were in the water, and I kept hearing this. And then you could hear, actually hear people from far away, and they were jumping off this cliff. So we started to swim towards it to see what it might be like. So we're swimming towards it. And as you got closer, you could see it was probably about three high dives tall, 30 feet. And you had to cr climb up this sort of dangerous rocky path, not dangerous, but difficult rocky path to get up. And so we're like, okay, we'll do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And so, so uh, off he goes, and I go, uh, I really went a lot slower. And we finally get up there and discover it's not 30 feet high. It's 450 feet high. <laughs> it's always higher when you're looking down. <laughs> it really was really funny. Here's the problem. There's only one way down. So we did the fool thing, and we jumped. And I have to tell you, it scared the life out of me. Sometimes it's really fearful to move forward. And I think that's what happens here for the Israelites. And there's a reason why it's fearful for them, uh, to, uh, why they're so afraid to move forward, and we'll see that. So would you stand and let me read the Word of God? 
Oh, and for those of you who are new here, the reason we read the Word of God is, and you need to know this if you're considering Christianity, we believe that the Word of God is the inerrant, infallible Word of God and a revelation of God himself who gives us life. So we stand not to worship the Word of God, but to honor God's Word. We're here to worship God, but we're honoring the truth of His Word when we stand. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam, Moses' sister, died and was buried. Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here of thirst? Why did you bring us out of Egypt to this terrible place? It doesn't have grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates. And there's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell face down. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You'll bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels! Must we, bring you, must, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. Livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. And these were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. Please be seated. Father, thank you for just the real privilege that we have to be together. And as we look at your word, Lord, I pray open our hearts for all of us to receive. I want to ask you to take just a moment to pray that the Lord would speak to you personally. Ask him to show you maybe one or two things that he has for you this morning. Father, we know you hear your people in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first point I'd like you to see is don't go back to Egypt. They have traveled a long way. This is towards the end, if you're familiar, with their wandering in the desert for 40 years. So they've been wandering, and they've been waiting, and they are very thirsty. In other words, they're under stress. Have you ever been under stress? Because you're waiting, because you're struggling, because something's breaking down. That's exactly what's happening here. And so what do they do? They start questioning. Contending is the word. They start questioning or quarreling with their leaders, Moses and Aaron. The first question they say is, why did you do this? If only we died before in the desert, we wouldn't be in this place of misery. If only, Lord, if only Moses. And they say, why did you ever bring us up out of Egypt? Why did you do that? In fact, we remember Egypt. There's no figs, there's no grapes, there's no pomegranates here. We remember Egypt. Why did you ever bring us up out of Egypt? And so they start complaining. Now, I want you to see a couple of things. Do you play the if-only game? Think about your life. Do you play the if-only? If-only. It just depends on how personal we want to be, so I'll be personal. If only I'd married that person instead of the one I'm with now. If I only lived there instead of here. If I only had this instead of nothing. You guys, can I tell you what if only will do? 
want you to listen to me carefully. Everybody, give me your focus. Listen. You know what if only you'll do? It's the gift that keeps on giving. It will keep on giving you misery. I promise you. They also ask the question, why? Now listen, you guys. Stressful circumstances, I think, per- are perfectly, it's perfectly legitimate to ask why. I was walking with a guy in the park Friday. He's in extremely stressful circumstances, and he's asking why. And we talked about it. And I think why is a legitimate question to ask in difficult circumstances. Here's the deal, though, and you've got to hear this. It's it's fine to ask God why, but I've got to tell you something. If you demand an answer for your allegiance, it's not going to work. If you demand an answer for your worship, it's not going to work. It won't. He will, I personally believe, and have experience, he will comfort you in the question of why, even when he chooses not to answer it right away. And very often he doesn't answer it right away. And let me tell you why. (laughs) Let me tell you why. No pun intended. Um, I think a few of the reasons are this. When I'm in stressful circumstances, how about you? When I'm in stressful circumstances, deeper issues in my heart tend to arise. They really do. I call it being raw. I don't know what it is, you guys, but when I'm raw, it's real. And God can bring real change, you guys. And I've got to tell you something. God is concerned about your immediate circumstances But far and away, he's much more concerned about you. And what you will become. And he will use those circumstances. He will. So they say, why and if only. And what's happened here, if you look at it, what's happened here is fear has paralyzed them from moving forward. And I want to say this, I, I really, I, I, I believe uh, personally here, the reason fear has paralyzed them from moving forward is they, they're, and this is what we'll see in just a minute, they're about to take, they're going to take matters into their own hands. They're trying to work this out from them, for themselves. And so here's what happens for them. They are fearful about moving forward because they don't realize they need not to look back and want to go back to Egypt. But if they're ever going to move forward, you guys, and if you're going to move forward, you've got to look up before you look out and forward. You've got to look up. Now listen. When you look, and I say look up, God's everywhere, but you know what I mean. So when you look up to the Lord, let me tell you something. We can't look up to the Lord. You know, and the older I get, the more I know this is true because I've lived longer. The, y'all listen to me. I, I used to look to God because I wanted to move forward. And I'm like, God, okay, I'm going to look to you. And here's what I'm looking. You tell me if you're as sinful as I am. Here's what I did. God, I'm going to look forward. Because I know you're going to guarantee me exactly what I want. You've got a money-back guarantee. I know it. So tell me how this is going to turn out. And then I'll go. It don't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Because if he tells you how it's going to work out before you go, you won't bother to take him. The life of faith is a life of faith in a person, not a circumstance. And that's what's happening here. They're paralyzed by fear. They're not moving forward. Because they're not looking up and trusting the Lord. Even with the difficult circumstances. You guys, thirst in the desert, if you've ever been in the desert, is perfectly legitimate. 
But the issue is they're not looking to the Lord. They're complaining to Moses. And they're saying, why and if only? Now, let me tell you what's happening. When they say, why, Moses, is this happening? The next temptation is, and what we'll see here, is to take matters into your own hands. Now, let's move on. So, look at verse 6. So, what do Moses and Aaron do? They're the leaders of the community. So, here's what they do. They immediately go to the Lord. And they fall face down. Okay? Now, literally in the Hebrew, that means, uh, that implies, or it really does mean, humility and submission. Humility is, Lord, I see you and I see me. I see you and I see myself in light of you. Okay? Humility is understanding my place before God. Okay? And so they fall face down in adoration. Submission is, falling face down is, okay, Lord. We will, we're here to hear from you and do what you tell us to do. Humility and submission. And that's what relationship with the Lord is, so, uh, uh, is, is, is about. It's about staking everything on God. You guys, it was so counterintuitive to me um, that I really didn't want to do it. So I was taking uh, scuba diving lessons. And this is probably 25 years ago. I don't know if you've ever taken stu- scu- scuba diving lessons. But they do this fool thing. They take you down to 50 feet. And then they cut your tank off. Your ox- oxygen, oxygen tank. And expect you to share the oxygen, oxygen regulator with somebody else that you've just met in the class. Now let me just ask you a question. Who do you think is going to win if there's a problem? Well, I was going to lose. It was counterintuitive for me to let them cut that oxygen off, and now I'm totally dependent on somebody else for my next breath. It was terrifying. You guys, I want to tell you something. You can trust Jesus for your next breath. Because if you trust Jesus for your next breath, you're either going to take it here or be with him. Now, these people are taking matters into their own hands. Okay? And so, watch what happens. Moses goes out of the presence of the Lord... And he goes off. Look at how it puts it here. You've got to understand, Moses is grieving the loss of his sister. He's under incredible stress. And here's what he says. Listen, you rebels. Must we bring water out of this rock? And then he takes that stick that God, the staff that God gave him, uh, told him to grab. And he hits the rock twice. Remember, he was told to speak to the rock. So here's what happens. He's operating out of anger instead of faith. Now, again, I don't think it's premeditated. I think he's operating more out of impulse than obedience. But here's what he's doing that's so dangerous that leads to the consequence of him not going into the promised land. In striking the rock, the people see and begin to think. And notice what Moses said. He said, must we bring water out of the rock? He says it in anger. And so what's subtly happening, and again, I don't think this is necessarily intentional, but it's so dangerous, is Moses is saying, must we bring water from the rock? And he smacks the rock. And guess who you think the people might be tempted to give credit to? That would be Moses. Listen, you guys, these are people who are prone prone to idolatry. I mean, they take gold, melt it, make it into a little cow and worship it. They're prone to idols. And I can tell you, the best idols are the things that are most precious blessings. Like your beautiful children. But if you turn your kids into little idols, you will destroy them. Don't do it. Love them. Enjoy them. But thank the God of the universe for them. These people would have been tempted to worship Moses 
And look at what Moses does. He took matters into his own hands here. You know, he struck this rock. And by doing that, in essence, he diminishes the glory of God and he sets himself up as a, if you'll excuse the pun, a rock star. <laughs> he really does set himself up for fame. Now, I, I, again, I think this is more out of uh, impulse. Now, in taking matters into your own hands, I don't know if you're prone to this. Let me throw this out to you as we think about it, okay? Let me offer you a way to diagnose that. Do I take matters into my own hands? You guys, I taught my children how to drive. I'll, the one that scared me the most shall remain uh, anonymous. But I had to grab the wheel a few times. We were both scared out of our minds. But it worked out fine. It did. And then from then on, I just hired driver's head. <laughs> Let them scare the hell out of them. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you guys, are you prone to grab the wheel? And how's that working for you? Take matters into your own hands. Here's, a, here's one way you can tell that you really are taking matters into your own hands. How are you doing at praying about things? How are you doing about praying about things? Do you pray about the do you pray about the sort of house you should buy? Do you pray about the car that you might want to buy? Do you pray about how much to give to God's work? Do you pray for your enemies? You guys, let me tell you, a prayerless life, and I've lived it before, a prayerless life is a life I think I can control. And you know what cures us of prayerlessness more than anything, right? You know what? It's called being out of control. So Moses really is trying to grab the wheel here. He takes matters into his own hands. And I want to tell you something. Let me tell you one of the tragedies, I think, of taking matters into your own hands. You will get as far as you can go. You will get as far as you can go. Those of you in the room who are not followers of Jesus, I, I want to say this to you. First, don't reject Jesus because you don't like some of his followers. Okay? Don't do that. Because you're not following his followers. You're, follow you're choosing whether to follow him or not. Okay? So don't do that. Don't reject Jesus because you think he's a Democrat or a Republican. Okay? Don't reject Jesus based on what you think his politics are. Get to know his person. And let that influence your politics. Okay? Now, when we pray, this is a demonstration of humility and submission. It really is. And the ultimate prayer is this. Can you pray this? The ultimate prayer is this. Not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done brings amazing things. Now, water for the journey. I want you to see something really cool. Hey, what do you think is um, the best thing about this passage? The best thing about this passage. What do you think it might be? Think about it for just a second. Is there any hope in this passage? Well, I love it. Can I tell you what the hope is? Well, I, the humility and the submission, I think, is great. But he loses it. He loses the humility and submission. He's frustrated. So what does he do? He says, you rebels. Must we bring water from the rock, thereby drawing attention to himself? He takes a stick, he whacks that rock, and then what happens? Do you remember? That's not a rhetorical question. What happens? 
Water comes from the rock. Now, I want you to follow me closely here. Moses struck the rock in sin. And yet, God brought living water from the rock. Listen to to what the Apostle Paul said. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors, and he's talking about the people in Numbers 20, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they passed through the sea, the parting of the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses. They followed Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate, listen, the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them in the wilderness. And that rock was Jesus. You guys, Jesus was struck. He was struck with our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He didn't strike back. He took it. And took our punishment on himself. And so our sin... was on him that his forgiveness could be for us. And he pours forth living water. And the water's forgiveness. The water's acceptance. The water's a future. And so he offers himself, men and women, and I want you to hear me clearly, this life can be, and it may be for you this morning, it can be hell. But with Jesus, there is water for the journey. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time together. Thank you for the privilege that we have to worship you. I really pray, you know, ultimately we can talk about this all day. But I pray, Lord, we're going to sing a couple of really great songs. We're going to experience confession and forgiveness together. Lord, we're going to sing the doxology. Father, as we finish this service, would you pour out the living water of your spirit on us? Fill our hearts with joy to sing at the top of our lungs that, Jesus, you paid it all. Fill our hearts with joy, Lord, that we would sing and wonder at your glory. And, Father, we pray this in Jesus' name.